Today on The Real Story, the youth vote showed up and showed up strong in these 2022 midterm elections, making a difference, and some say possibly keeping that predicted red wave at bay. This morning, we talked to two members of Gen Z who are active in the political world to learn more about what is driving young people to get out and vote. Plus, it's Native American Heritage Month. Do you know what tribes are doing every day in the state of Connecticut, from education reform to economic contributions and representation in federal government. We're talking with a leader of the Mohegan tribe. That's all coming up today on The Real Story. Joining us on The Real Story, I'm Emma Woolforst. Looking at early voter data, this midterm election had the second highest voter turnout in almost three decades. And while younger voters are known to be less politically committed to parties, many voted Democrat this election, so much so some analysts say they effectively cancel out the anticipated red wave of 2022. Joining me now to take a closer look at these trends are Kevin Curian, a youth organizer and campaign staffer for Governor Lamont and Nicholas Marini, chair of the Connecticut Federation of College Republicans. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having us. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course. Yeah, long time listener, glad to be on. <laughs> Fantastic. So jumping in here, preliminary data shows 27% of people aged 18 to 29 cast a ballot in 2022, making this, like I said, the midterm election with the second highest voter turnout in almost three decades. You were both out talking to young voters leading up to these midterms, both on the campaign and registration trails. So from what you both saw, we'll, we'll start with Kevin and then head over to Nicholas. Were you expecting young voter, voter turnout to be quite so high? I was, yeah. I, for the past two cycles, uh, 2018, the mid Trump's midterm, then 2020, the presidential, we saw record high uh, Gen Z voter turnout. And uh, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that Gen Z is pretty fed up with our current political situation. Uh, I, th I think people are pretty impatient on things like gun control legislation, protection for LGBTQ youth, and also, like everyone else, a little concerned about the rising costs of practically everything. Um, so I, I I was pretty confident going into the election the night before that youth turnout would be high. Wasn't expecting it to be quite so high, but I'm relieved that it was. Right, I, I absolutely agree with my new friend Kevin, and I was also surprised about the incredibly high turnout in the youth, um, but also disappointed with low turnout overall. You, you look in the cities, and some cities 30, 40, 50 percent lower voter turnout than in 2018. And I think a lot of that is, um, you know, we're seeing the late stages of, of um, you know, unethical and short-sighted campaign strategies. I think that's definitely taking a toll on voter turnout overall, but I, I was very pleasantly surprised to see the youth tur tur turn out big and turn out strong this election. Absolutely. Kevin, we'll go to you for this question. It's become clear young voters cast their ballots predominantly Democrat. We've seen some preliminary exit poll data showing youth voters prefer Democrats by a 28 point margin. For you, why do you think that is? It's a good question, and it wasn't surprising to me that youth voters would swing so heavily to uh, Democrats in the first place. You know, my generation, we're coming of age in a really politically turbulent time. A lot of us grew up and uh, started becoming involved in politics during the Trump presidency. Uh, and quite frankly, I speak for myself personally, and I know billions of other uh, Gen Z voters, that we were really disappointed uh, in President Trump's uh, four years in office, and uh, quite frankly, disappointed in a lot of uh, Republican legislators not doing what they ought to have done on gun, right, uh, gun control, uh, not doing what they ought to have done on protecting uh, immigrants, especially on our southern border. Um, and I, I think that there's an overall aspect of the youth vote that really has to be considered in that Gen Z voters really want to hear a vision, a positive vision. You know, it's not so much about, you know, what you're against and complaining about this state or this country. It's got to be about what you're for, what policies you want to push forward and what 
you're going to do if you get office. And now, Nicholas, obviously not every Gen Z voter is voting Democrat. There are some who are voting Republican. So from what you heard on the ground, those who are voting Republican, why is that? What's their reasoning there? Well, a lot of what I hear, and obviously everyone's reasoning isn't going to be exactly identical with everyone else's, but there are three commonalities that I find when speaking to the youth this election cycle. First one being affordability. People are concerned that they're not going to be able to live in Connecticut, afford to live in Connecticut, afford to raise a family. Uh, may, many of them were born and raised in Connecticut. And there's a lot of concern about whether or not they're going to be able to continue to do that. Secondly, uh, another one of the commonalities that I found was the economy. Uh, people in Connecticut, especially young people, they want to have a job. They want to have a good paying and fulfilling job without commuting to New York every day. And thirdly, uh, a, a lot of what's on, especially the youth's mind, is the drug epidemic that we're currently going through. It, it started before COVID and it has exacerbated since. Um, it seems that everyone I talk to at least has secondhand experience uh, with someone that they know battling addiction or even worse, uh, a, a loved one passing away. So th those are the concerns that I see a lot on people's minds, and that definitely pushes them to vote more Republican. So it seems like uh, some similar issues for both sides there for Gen Z. And we'll get to more issues in a second, but sticking with Nicholas, what do you think, why do you, why, excuse me, do you think young voters didn't turn out as much for the Republican Party in these midterms? And Looking to the next two years, we're looking ahead now at the 2024 presidential election. What do you think the GOP can do to energize some of that young voter base? Well, I, I would like to just start off by saying I have a tremendous amount of respect for my colleagues, especially the young people on the other side of the political aisle. Um, it's, it's a very hard job, and I respect everything that you do. And, and I think that you're doing what you should be doing, which is fighting for what you believe in. And that's what we're doing, too. Um, as to why the vote was uh, disappointingly low in Gen Z's for Republicans, I feel like this is just common practice for the current era of campaigning that we find ourselves in. There's always a lot of negative messaging flying around. And I understand that some level of negative messaging m might even be required, but uh, there definitely was a lot thrown, ab thrown around. Um, there's a lot of psychological studies that say that fear and anger are the most motivating emotions. Um, it's just it's backed by a lot of science, and I think that um, what we're witnessing is a lot of short-sighted campaign strategies. While it's very useful in increasing short-term voter turnout, I think it had, leaves a lot to be desired in terms of long-term political satisfaction. And I think that's what we're seeing in the older generations who turned out very low, especially in the cities in Connecticut. Um, there was a lot of that negative messaging, and it's just been increasing in the last couple of election cycles, so they're very disenfranchised. I believe that if we were to continue doing that, then we would be disenfranchising our new voters who are coming in right now. Gotcha. And Kevin, we'll head to you for this one. This election, we saw Maxwell Frost, the very first Gen Z congressperson elected down in Florida with massive youth support there. Do you feel younger candidacy and representation is important? both on Capitol Hill and here in Connecticut. You bet. I was super heartened to see Representative-elect now, Maxwell Alejandro Frost, uh, win that seat in Florida of all places, too, uh, in what was a very good year for the Florida Republican Party. I, I think it's always really great to see uh, younger candidates uh, stepping up. And I think it does something to voter turnout among my generation to see people who can directly speak to their issues because they're not so far removed from them. Two people who I admire a great deal, Treasurer-elect Eric Russell and Comptroller-elect Sean Scanlon, are actually the first two uh, millennial statewide elected officials within Connecticut. Uh, and, and you see a lot of really great state legislative candidates who are also Gen Z and millennial. I specifically shout out Representative-elect uh, Bumgarner and uh, Groton, among many, many other uh, youth uh, legislators. But one thing I was really happy to see was that it wasn't just 
youth, uh, you, you know, young candidates stepping up. It was also young organizers. You know, when, when, I, when we were traveling the state with Governor Lamont, meeting everybody from the Danbury young Democrats to the Farmington High School young Democrats, you know, youth voters were really, really energetic this cycle. Absolutely. I'd love to talk more about candidates, but I want to hit on issues really quickly with both of you here. So some say young people are single issue voters. We've heard that term thrown around, and I'd like to hear from both of you. We'll start with Nicholas on this one. Do you think that's true? And if so, what do you think that single issue or most important issue is for young voters here in Connecticut? I think that's definitely, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't particularly agree with that. I think that young voters, um, especially with the advent of all these me media sources that we use to inform ourselves, that people, especially the younger people, are more, more informed now more than ever. Um, but if I were to single out maybe the main factor that is driving young people to the polls, I would say affordability. Like I said, people are concerned about how they're going to live, you know, how they're going to graduate school and go off to start a family and, um, and to get a job. Absolutely, inflation a big issue for voters of all ages. And um, for you now, what do you think that, that most important issue is? And do you think single issue voter is a correct term to describe youth voters? So I, I think vote, vote you up. <laughs> youth voters are quite nuanced and I, I don't agree with the single issue idea. I, th I think that there are two big issues, the economy and a choice uh, in, in the minds of uh, young voters. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, the huge decision that Connecticut voters uh, faced. You had one candidate who signed a pretty strong uh, abortion protection bill earlier this year, then another candidate who was for uh, rolling back certain rights. And, and that was something that we definitely noticed. You know, it, voters definitely worry about if they can afford to live in a state, but a lot of young women in this state, too, get to worrying, am I going to be able to live if I have an unplanned pregnancy? And some of the things that we're seeing in Republican states right now are pretty shocking, and that definitely drove the youth voter turnout, not just in Connecticut, but nationwide. I think we saw abortion ended up being a big issue for lots of different voters of all ages here in Connecticut. Well, I wish we had more time to get into this. It went by quickly, but thank you both again so much for taking the time to chat with us this morning. Morning. It was a pleasure for having us. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. And up next on The Real Story, Connecticut is home to five federally recognized tribes and a large population of Native Americans. Joining us today is a council elder from Mohegan, here to tell us more about their many contributions to the state, from education to economics and policy, all big topics during this Native American Heritage Month. Coming up next.